The broadcast is now starting. All attendees are in listen-only mode. Hello and uh, welcome to the Youth Development Division Online Youth Reengagement Webinar. We'll be starting here just in a few minutes. Um, the rest of the YDD staff have uh, put me on camera, so I'll be hanging out here with you this afternoon. Uh, just as a announcement to all the attendees, this is being recorded, um, and so we'll have a recording posted uh, early next week of this webinar as well. So I'll go. I'll be back here in about a minute or so as we continue to have some attendees sign on. Thank you. Hi, Brian. Thanks for joining us. We're going to get started here to those that have signed on to the re-engagement webinar, informational re-engagement webinar here. We'll give it another minute or so. Uh, it looks like we have about half of the registered attendees signed in, so we'll give it another minute. But uh, just as we're getting ready, um, all the attendees, you'll notice that you are muted. Um, we have quite a few uh, people that are attending this webinar, so to make it as easy and streamlined, uh, we do have all participants muted. Um, we'll be doing some introductions from YDD staff here shortly. Uh, we are interested in making sure that we hear your questions and your comments regarding this presentation. So um, all the attendees will notice that there's a question box on the bottom part of your screen. We ask that you please do enter any of your questions or comments in the bottom there. Um, I, be I believe um, many of the attendees probably know Cord from uh, the YDD staff. He'll be monitoring those throughout. Uh, the presentation, and we'll be trying to address those both in the uh, comment boxes. Hi, Cord. Thanks for signing up. As well as um, we'll pause uh, throughout the presentation to do some verbal response to some of the questions as well. I uh, just do want to note that some of the questions may require follow-up, and so we may, may not be able to respond uh, at this presentation, but those responses will be provided in the Q&A document, and Cord will note that in the response uh, for those questions for you. All right, so we are right about at 2.02. It looks like we have a good percentage of the registered attendees signed on. So we'll go ahead and begin the presentation. Uh, and uh, again, as you move through, as we move through the presentation, please make sure to type those questions into the question box in your screen. And Cord will be managing those questions and responding both verbally throughout the presentation, but also in the boxes as well. All right, so uh, my name is Paul Sell. I'm the re-engagement system manager for the Oregon Youth uh, Development Division. And uh, I joined the staff uh, in May of this year during the COVID pandemic and uh, am looking forward to sharing a, a little bit about the re-engagement work we've been focused on today. Uh, I came from K-12 education, just a little bit about my background. I came from K-12 education as an educator, as well as an administrator and an alternative ed administrator um, at the high school level. So with that, I will turn it over to Brian to introduce himself as the director for YDD. Thanks so much, Paul. Can you hear me? Is the audio working? Great. Uh, I just want to uh, first say thank you. Thank you to Paul um, and Cord and the rest of the um, Youth Development Division staff who've worked really hard on 
uh, launching this and getting us to this really important moment. Our former director, Serena Stoudemire Wesley, also worked really hard, of course, really closely with um, Oregon legislators as well um, to get this uh, whole thing launched and going forward. So we're just really excited to be at this point in the process. I'm relatively new as director at the Youth Development Division, and so I won't take up a lot of time. Um, just excited to be uh, involved in, at this point in the process, uh, have a background working with young people, with um, organizations, uh, really with different populations around the state on uh, various uh, issues impacting youth. And so I'm excited to have uh, to bring this these two opportunities to uh, our community of, of providers um, and education stakeholders. Um, so thanks so much for everybody for being here. I know a lot going on for folks in this in 2020, so we appreciate your attendance, your involvement. Um, look forward to those who are submitting applications and answering questions as we go throughout the process. So thank you so much. Hi, I'll, I guess I'll go next. My name is Cord Buker. I am the Special Projects Manager for the Youth Development Division, uh, also the Interim Chief of Staff. And um, I, uh, I may have worked with some of the folks joining us as a grant manager, um, uh, working with a number of workforce and innovation grantees in the past, uh, and um, we've been working with Paul to launch our re-engagement system and our grants initiative. And uh, I'll be monitoring the question box and uh, typing in some answers. Um, as Paul noted, there may be some things that we will have to follow up and provide responses on. And our goal is to get all the questions and responses together. And we're going to be posting those in a document on the um, page on our website where all the re-engagement uh, and documentation information is located. Uh, and I believe we may be sending that out and some email updates as well. So we're going to try to get everything responded to in a timely fashion. Um, and uh, we look forward to hearing from you and we're excited to share this information today. Thanks, Cord. I'll go next. Uh, Melissa Gallardo is my name. I am even newer to this team than Brian is uh, as the executive support. So I'm really excited to be here and I'm really eager to hear what Paul has to tell all of us in uh, my first ever webinar with our team. Thanks. Hi, I'm Sonia Stenson. I'm a procurement and contract specialist with the Department of Education, and I will be the single point of contact for both of the RFAs that have been released. And I will also shepherd the grant agreements through the negotiation process when the uh, awards have been given in December. All right. So, uh, Thank you, uh, YDD staff and uh, ODE staff for introducing yourself. You'll see them kind of come in and out of the screen. Uh, we kind of made the agreement again that uh, uh, I'm staying on the screen, I guess, the whole time since I'm the presenter uh, today. Uh, a couple things just as we get going. Again, uh, I see some people putting some questions or comments into the into the question box. We appreciate that. That helps us uh, kind of monitor it. This is also a brand new process, not only the re-engagement grants, but also the, the webinar. So if you have feedback for that, please do feel free to share it with us if it's helpful or if you have suggestions for improvement on that. With that, we'll go ahead and uh, get started. As soon as I can get my computer working. There we go. So the agenda is, you know, there's, there's quite a bit of things on the agenda. What we're trying to do is to give you a, an overview of the RFAs and youth development's work with re-engagement the past year and a half. And so we wanted to give context to the application questions and the information as well as really what, the, what we're seeking to provide uh, to the state of Oregon. And then also utilize the current communication channels that we have out because we have expanded the options. Uh, if we've met with you prior, we've expanded the options of, these, of this RFA to include all level, all different areas throughout the state, as well as expanded priority regions, which we'll talk about uh, throughout that. And then obviously we wanna answer any questions uh, that you might have. Uh, so the general ones we'll answer as we go through, but then also gather the Q&A questions for the RFA process. So just to begin very quickly, uh, the Youth Development Division was tasked with creating uh, the statewide youth re-engagement system as part of the 2019 Student Success Act. Over the past year and a half, YDD has been, been doing community engagement as well as working on the administrative rules and the RFA process um, during that time. 
And uh, we are excited to finally have it released. Obviously, there's been a, um, some different things that have happened throughout the year that, it may, that have slowed the process, but we are excited to finally be, have the RFAs launched. Um, in the legislation and administrative rules around re-engagement in the re-engagement system, there's three main areas that were talked about in terms of the youth of the youth that are eligible for re-engagement, the eligible re-engagement providers, and then also the required re-engagement program elements. And we'll dive into each one of those throughout the presentation, but those are the general premises around uh, how re-engagement re is set up uh, through the legislative and administrative rules within YDD. So to begin, when we really start talking about the Oregon Youth Re-Engagement System, there's multiple pathways in which we're going to help support this work statewide. So obviously the Oregon Youth Re-Engagement Fund is why we're here today. Those are the grant funds as part of it. But the Oregon Youth Re-Engagement System really wants to help support community-based re-engagement programs because we know the connections with, with youth are incredibly important and in the community-based connections with youth uh, is what's gonna make the difference. And when we look at regional collaboratives, that's an idea around supporting the, the different regions throughout the state. And what does that look like as we move forward in terms of engaging with some professional development, all as, as well as looking at the different needs that each region throughout the state has. And then the statewide network is, is the collection of information through all of the programs at a state level. When we look at the Oregon Youth Reengagement Fund, the purpose of the grant itself is to make grants for the implementation, expansion, and coordination of the re-engagement programs and services. We, through that, we have several system goals. Uh, the first is obviously reconnecting youth to support diploma and GED completion. Uh, we want to help them, help youth find their education programming if they haven't met it as of yet, and then also to retain or aid in the retention of those of those youth once they're re-engaged back into the systems. And then we also know that youth leave education youth who leave education have a reason that they're leaving. So trying to find and deliver specialized education and training and support services to help students want to come back that have left uh, school prior to graduation or GED completion. The third goal that we're looking to provide is meeting the youth where they are at and supporting the whole person or the holistic education option. And that's through innovative and trauma-informed culturally responsive uh, programming that supports them. And lastly is to build connection between the organizations that support youth. There's many outstanding programs throughout the state and how can we help build a more collective system both at a regional and a state level? We know that that's important because of the mobility of youth. And so how does that look and how do we help best support that? So as part of the Oregon Youth Reengagement Fund, uh, we've recently launched two different and separate uh, RFAs. Uh, the first is called a Regional Re-Engagement re Opportunity Grant, and it's designed to support youth re-engagement programs throughout the state. Those funds, uh, those grant funds are up to $120,000 each, and we're looking to anywhere from 20 to 40 of those grant recipients uh, for these short-term grants. The regional re-engagement grants are larger grants that top out at $320,000, and they're designed to support not only youth re-engagement programs, but also the regional re-engagement efforts. And we'll talk about what those re-engagement efforts look like here shortly. The main goal is that we want the grants to be flexible, designed to meet the youth and community needs, and expand the current options, as well as encourage new options for youth around the state. So um, you'll notice that there's some key uh, 2020 re-engagement grant information listed here. The first is that these are short-term grants. All grant funding for these two grants end on June 30th, 2021. Um, and that's because of the end of the biennium. The startup costs are new for YDD, but we can part, you can, uh, in your grant proposal, ask for startup costs for up to 20% of the grant funds. And then through our community, re our, our community engagement, we've had lots of questions around what does it look like in the next biennium? So we wanna put it and be very straightforward that we do anticipate re-engagement funds as we go into the new biennium, and we're still looking at the application and it, that application is in process. One of the biggest questions because of the regional re-engagement grants that has come up is, are they gonna be renewed? And we are considering processes on how that could look uh, moving forward. So more information to come as we move further into it. Um, also a couple questions that's come up over the course of the past couple weeks. 
Um, so yes, current YDD grantees can apply for these grants. So there isn't, as long as you're an eligible entity, these grant options are open. And there's a couple other questions that have developed around um, what grants to apply for. So yes, you can apply for both grants, but entities would only be awarded one of the two grants if they were um, successful on both applications. And also re-engagement partners, as you continue to develop those, um, that's not, they're eligible for these uh, awards as well. With that, I'm gonna go ahead and give it a quick break. It sounds like there's several questions. Court, if you wanna jump on here and maybe we can answer several of these questions. Yeah, you know, I'm, I'm actually typing responses. Um, so just to kind of tell everybody what's going on, I'm having to keep track of all the questions and responses in a separate document. Um, it's also helping with spell checking though. So I'm getting responses typed up and I'm dropping them into the questions. So um, I'm gonna, if I, I could take another minute or two, Paul, if you wanna maybe um, continue on, I'm gonna get responses up and then I can come back and read out the questions and responses that I have entered. That sounds great. Um, a couple of the questions I do see that I, I think are probably some burning questions that I can um, answer very quickly. So yes, the PowerPoint will be available after this. We'll upload it um, early next week along with the video of this presentation. Uh, and the question and answer were also, that's why Cord's bouncing back and forth to make sure that we're able to be able to manage uh, those questions and, and get back to all of the questions as we move forward. So the grant priorities, uh, the grant priorities, um, so we're focusing on youth for ages 14 to 21. That's part of the Student Success Act um, legislation, as well as focused in on that high school completion or GED option. Uh, it, we're looking for the disconnected or out of school youth and underserved population. There's more definition around eligible youth and how youth get uh, into the program here shortly. We want pro programs to be responsive in that they're offering culturally specific and trauma-informed outreach and services to youth. We really want to dive deeper into understanding the factors of disconnection and, and what are the best practices around re-engagement statewide, as well as the accountability. So re-engagement programs will report on key performance metrics as well as individual program goals as we go through the process within it. The data includes outreach and enrollment information as well as credit attainment and completion. So in the, in the statute, the youth eligible for re-engagement programs include what you see on the screen. It's the ages 14 to 21 uh, who have left school and not completed a high school uh, diploma or GED, as well as youth that are referred. And there's a list that you can see on the screen of who can refer, organiz what organizations can refer youth to re-engagement programs. And lastly, I think is a really important bullet is that students 16 to 21 who are behind in high school credits, and there's more definition in the RFAs and the, and the documents you find on the website, but it really is important. We don't want youth to have to drop out to access these programs, but they are identified to be um, behind in credits. So the eligible entities that can apply are also listed here, and it's a broad array of uh, the school districts, as well as uh, different organizations, youth serving organizations throughout the state. Uh, one of the things that I, I do want to note is that on several of the slides, I've added an application note. So when you go into SM Apply, there's, you're going to see a different screen, and this is our uh, online application system. The application has two parts. It has a first initial screening, as well as then the grant application questions. So the eligibility will be during that initial screening where you'll identify which type of entity you are. And then also to note for school districts applying for the RRG, which is the regional re-engagement grant, uh, school districts would have to, if they're a sponsor or organization, will identify the other districts that they're working with as part of their partnerships during that initial screening. So just be aware that that information will be needed as you move through that grant process. Hey, Paul, this is Cord. Absolutely. Hey, so um, I'm still a few questions away. I've gotten some more since I was entering those. I am entering answers, and it seems like it worked well for you to read the questions and responses. I can. Um, so if you want to do that, I'll just kind of focus on providing responses. I haven't seen any yet that I cannot provide an answer for, but um, I'll note if we're going to have to follow up if there's anything we don't have an immediate response for. All right, absolutely. Um, so let me readjust my screen here a little bit to answer some of those questions. 
So uh, one of the big questions that I see on here is what happens to funds uh, not spent by June 30, 2021, and the funds not expended by June 20 or June 30th, 2021 are not carried over as part of the grant process. So those go back into the general fund. Um, how many re regional grants do we plan to award? I apologize that I missed that one. We plan uh, to award five to eight, depending on the applications uh, that are turned in and the number of applications that are turned in. Uh, another question is, my organization operates at different locations. Will one application be sufficient or do we need to submit an application for each site? Um, the answer that Cord put in there is, if an organization is providing programming at multiple sites or, commu or communities, you may submit a single application. And the application will be allow you uh, space to define that as you go through that online application. Um, since 15% of the grant can be used for admin or overhead, what are some examples of costs that are not admin or overhead that we can use the other 85% of funding on? So the response that was typed in is, we recommend you download the proposed graduate grant budget template located on the web page, and it will have uh, the categories all listed out in definition and response. Um, and then we did answer the one of if the slideshow will be made available for it. All right. So I'll let Cord continue to go through those. Um, those those answers are being posted as well as we will post them uh, with this with this uh, recording as well. So looking at the grant specifically, the Regional Opportunity Grant is open to any eligible entity in Oregon. Uh, within the RFA, we have identified that we that YDD intends to award at least one re-engagement re opportunity grant in each priority region. We'll talk about the priority regions here in the next slide. The regional re-engagement grants are open to eligible entities serving one of the eight priority regions around Oregon. A couple of things to note about the legislation and the administrative rules is that the educational services for any of these grants have to be made available for program participants. It does not have to be paid for by the grant funds, but program participants do need access to be able to complete their high school diploma or GED options. And the second is that a re at least one re-engagement partner is required for either one of these grants. And we'll define what re-engagement partners are later in the presentation, as well as uh, within the RFA. So one of our goals in this work was to really focus on where we can um, best stand up or expand re-engagement services and have the biggest impact for this work. As we said earlier in the presentation, there are uh, lots of different resources and opportunities for youth around the state, but we also have areas where more support is needed and we want to make sure that we're able to provide both to the current programs out there as well as start new programs uh, in areas that have less support. So the priority regions are used to help identify where the greatest need is. And so that one of the main data points that we used was what we're calling a five-year cohort non-completer rate. That non-completer rate is the other side of the five-year completer rate that's published by ODE. And what we found is that there's some big gaps in different locations around the state that extra supports and um, services would be benefit those youth. We also looked at the four-year completer rates uh, as an indication to emerging or persistent low completion rates as of that. The other piece that we looked at, as we've talked about already, is the availability of existing re-engagement or alternative education programs. Excuse me. <clears throat> and lastly, we also want to look at the footprint that YDD is serving grants statewide. And so we looked at the current and past YDD community investment grants. So the priority regions that we've identified for uh, this first round of RFAs are posted on the screen. There's eight different uh, regions and they're broken down mainly by counties, but you'll also notice that there are some in the more metropolitan areas broke down more by school districts. A couple things to note uh, in terms of the application. The RRG requires all or a portion of the priority region to be eligible to apply. A regional opportunity grant, priority regions are recommended but are not required. Uh, priority regions are identified during the initial screening, so you'll want to have that information ready when you enter uh, to do the initial screening of the application. 
Now, as we talked earlier, the proposed, the proposed service area is based off of priority region identified. And the proposed service area is what the applicant proposes in terms of how to best serve the area with their current proposal. So priority regions are a starting place for YDD. They're not to further, they'll be further defined as the applications come forth. So please be creative and, and understand that these are an area that we that we saw as a need, but uh, as you are the local providers, I'm sure that there are other um, areas of need that you'll need, that you'll see and be able to provide within that. So with that, I am gonna go ahead and pause on the RFA timelines. So that's a pretty straightforward slide and I know most of you can see that on the screen. So we'll go back to the questions on that cord. Were there anything, was there anything specific that you wanted to address at this point, or do you want me to look back at the, at the questions? Um, if you wanna um, read them, that's fine. I'll just say that there are a couple where I've, I've noted that there's some things, Paul, that you're gonna cover further in the slideshow. So folks, see the answer, you hear what Paul has to say, and you have another question, feel free to ask again if you need clarification. Um, and uh, yeah, I've still got about like six questions in the queue here, so um, I'll keep working on typing responses in if you wanna read them, Paul. That sounds great. Thank you, Cord. So um, let me see where we're at in here. So uh, one of the questions is, is this a reimbursement grant? Yes, these are reimbursement funds uh, outside of the startup fund. So the startup funds would be uh, finalized during the negotiations and then you would receive those funds and then it's a reimbursement grant based from there. Um, could an ESD apply for both grants if one was going towards regional coordination of re-engagement and the other was going towards a specific ESD run program that a student is facing? So uh, any, el any eligible entity can apply for both grants, but an application, uh, if they're awarded a regional re-engagement grant, would not receive the opportunity grant. Do we have, in do we have to apply with a collaborative or consortium for either opportunity. Um, as we talked about, at least one re-engagement partner, and that's gonna be defined by the applicants themselves. We have some suggested uh, partners uh, in the RFAs, but that would be something that would be designed by the applicant. All right. So I will go ahead and continue with the PowerPoint. Please do keep those questions moving forward. Um, I'm seeing some people responding to them, so thank you. Uh, we're gonna dive a little bit more into the specifics around the application itself. All right, so when we talk about re-engagement services, this is really um, diving more into the specifics of the application itself. And so the re-engagement opportunity grant uh, is for a variety of community-based re-engagement services. The key difference and the key piece to know with that one is at minimum, uh, the applicant must identify and provide one of the six re-engagement services that we have listed on the next slide. The regional re-engagement grants have uh, more responsibility in that they're going to identify and provide all six of the re-engagement services within that prescribed service area as well as help coordinate the regional re-engagement efforts across, count, uh, across communities, across school districts, across different areas uh, that is designed within the service area. So the re-engagement services as outlined in the RFAs are listed here in bold. So the outreach services are really, how do we identify, connect with, and have students or have youth uh, come into the services, and then also how do we retain them? The educational services are pretty straightforward in that it's a D diploma or a GD option. And then we know that relationships and that connection is very important in the research around re-engagement. So what one-on-one -on -one academic or career coaching or case management is the provider going to be offering for, for youth? And, and that may be connected with the outreach services and the other parts of this, but it definitely is uh, one of the key required services. One of the biggest categories I think in this is college and career services, which really is big because we don't wanna limit youth as they come into these programs. So you'll notice that it involves workforce development, career training, and our post-secondary readiness and access. So there's, it is a very big category within the services. 
The support services has been one of the major ones we've heard about as we've gone and done community engagement throughout this COVID pandemic. One of the major supports that I believe is needed is mental uh, health supports and counseling. And this is part of what could be a part of the re-engagement services. The other thing we've heard is we've engaged with rural communities is the basic needs assistance. And basic needs assistance from anything from transportation to really the internet as we're doing this distance learning. And those are all parts of things that these grants can help support as we move forward. And lastly, we don't want uh, these relationships to not help youth move forward in the next steps after they complete. So what services uh, are available for participants after a diploma or GED is earned while they're in these re-engagement programs. Now, again, an opportunity grant is going to focus in on one, two, or maybe all of these on a different, on a smaller nature. A re-engagement, a regional re-engagement grant is going to focus in on all six of them provided over a specific service area and region. So now we're moving into the application evaluation and awards, and we'll dive specifically into some of the questions. Um, it looks like some of you in, in the online portal have, have gone in and, and registered within that, so that um, you may have seen some of this information, but we will dive a little bit deeper into it. But as of right now, I'm going to turn and just kind of look at what questions Court has put out there to make sure that people are hearing what, they're, what we're, uh, he's responding to. So does it have to be credit attainment for students earning a GED or dual credit at college level? High school credit is less of an incentive. Uh, educational services are not required to include high school credit attainment. Uh, GED programs are also encouraged. So there's really the dual credit GED options, all of those uh, elements can apply into that, that category. Um, could an ES, oh, we've answered the ESD question. Um, I'm gonna go back through here. Um, so what are the realistic outcomes expected given the short time? timeline? I think that's a great question. Um, and it's something the YDD has been asking ourselves as well. So um, we'll talk about what the um, key performance metrics are, but we also recognize that we are looking at a short time frame within six months. And so that's where some of those program specific goals will come into play in terms of what that is. All right. So I'll let court keep answering some of those questions um, within that, uh, and we'll move forward into some more specifics around the questions themselves. So one of the things that I do want to point out, I forgot to talk about earlier in the PowerPoint, is right up here where you have um, the ROG and the RRG. Those are uh, connections back to the numbering system within the RFA. So if you want more details, I tried to connect it so that you can easily access that. Um, information. So I'm going to go back to one back one slide and the information required by applicants. So you can see really where the questions uh, within the RFA are focused of service area, your service population, youth and youth voice, um, and then describing the who your re-engagement partners are, as well as the re-engagement services that you're going to be providing. So in the in these next slides, I've broken down those questions a little bit further. So the proposed service area population and equity. So this is really where the applicant is going to talk about the proposed service area and the service population. As we said before, the priority regions are a starting point uh, that YDD is designed off of data. Now, the local areas are going to know more of where those, are, those specific needs are. And so this is the opportunity for the applicants to explain uh, the proposed service area and how it meets within that. Um, just as a reminder, to be considered within a priority region, these areas must be identified here. So if you're within and serving one of the counties, but you're serving areas outside of that as well, make sure to highlight that priority region. The other piece is to use data to make the case for the proposed communities that are going to be served. And we do point you to the ODE equity lens as being a key component to that, that work. The cross-sector coordination and service delivery is really where um, the discussion around re-engagement partners is going to happen. And again, this is designed through the applicants. Um, so you're going to outline specific re-engagement partners and what resources are going to be provided there, as well as go into depth uh, about the re-engagement services that the organization or organizations are going to be providing within that, as well as identify the providers with that. So for the regional re-engagement grant only uh, is 
going to be more definition because of the regional portion of this grant, where the applicant is going to describe the re-engagement program's governance model, as well as outlining what the partnerships and services will be more specifically and define, both defined as well as managed on, on that. So one of those questions about the multiple service areas would be one of be something that would be addressed here. The next section of the application is talking about the re-engagement goals and data. And I know there were several questions around that. So um, this is really where the applicant's gonna talk about the data reporting capacity uh, of those. And, and each organization has a different level of, of reporting capacity. And so we'll discuss that in this section, as well as then uh, depending on what grant you're applying for. In the regional re-engagement grant, uh, you're gonna set um, organization targets for each of the defined key performance metrics. And also you'll see the performance metrics here in just a, a moment or several of them here in just a moment. The re-engagement opportunity grant, we recognize that different services are gonna be provided through that grant. And so the program is gonna outline the program goals based off of the key performance metrics. So they're not gonna identify specifically um, what the target is for the performance metric, but outline the goal itself for the organization. So when we talk about key performance metrics, it's gonna be relatively straightforward, especially as these are short-term grants. So the number of eligible youth, the number in, who are enrolled in the program, and then kind of the, the youth progress. So are they staying enrolled? Are they earning credits, passing GED tests? Are they making progress towards completion? And then lastly, the number of youth that earn their GED or high school diploma. We recognize that some of that data is going to be uh, unique, both within the COVID era, but also as we are looking at a short-term grant response, some of that data comes in after the fact. And so that'll be all part of the negotiation process. So now we're gonna move uh, into the, the attached documents or the documents that come in align with that. So as Cord referenced in one of the question uh, responses is that we have a proposed budget template uploaded on the YDD re-engagement website. And as part of the grant application, you'll need to download that document and complete all of the tasks. And it is the same form for both grants. Um, in there, it talks about expenditure report instructions as well as category definition. And then you can see in blue are the three required areas to be considered as you move forward. So the proposed program budget, just as a keynote, your program budget should match the re grant request amount that's in the actual application. The startup costs, uh, applicants will outline what their startup costs would look like and can be up to 20% of the grant request. And that is a piece that will be at the beginning part of the grant once all the grant agreements are, are finalized. And everything else past that will be a reimbursement rate based grant. Uh, and then lastly, the sub budgets. So we recognize that there are going to be some contracted services. So anything over $10,000 will have a separate uh, sub budget tab that will need to be entered into it. Anything under that will stay within the program budget tab and in the appropriate um, category. And then lastly, if you need, obviously, if you need more of those sub budget tabs, you can contact the uh, SPC um, for additional um, access to that. And then lastly, make sure you upload it into the SM Apply window. Uh, there's, it's, um, it's pretty straightforward in terms of uploading as an Excel format, but please do verify the name that's outlined within the RFA process. And lastly, again, this is uh, re-engagement, uh, regional re-engagement grant applications only that need to provide the re-engagement partnership document. We recognize that this is a unique time. So really it's some sort of written verification for any planned re-engagement partner providing these re required services. Uh, within SM Apply, the sponsor organization will note which ones they are going to be providing specifically. And so no written response is required with that. And you can see on the screen the again the required re-engagement services as well as if you're partnering with the tribal government that would be a um, uh, uploaded document that you'd want to provide as well as some recommended re-engagement partners on the right hand side so as we move into that um, this that's actually the last slide that you can see now is where you can find some additional information and materials a couple things to point out so our single point of contact is listed here, our SPO, uh, SPC. Um, we would recommend that you sign, register for ORPIN. It is not a requirement of the grant as YDD has our separate online application system, but registering for 
ORPIN, which is a free registration, will get you updates sent to you electronically versus having to visit the YDD website. And you can also see on there that that's the um, official application site listed below. So with that, Cord, I'd ask if you don't mind coming back onto the screen and we can address some of the questions. You kind of know where you're at with some of those responses. And maybe- Yeah, maybe, I actually- I'm Not sure if you want to join us. Great. Are you guys hearing and seeing me? Yes, I can see you, sorry. Okay, it's, super. It's really weird being on screen and not seeing any of the participants. <laughs> Um, so we've gotten a lot of questions, which is great. Um, I've, I've been able to provide responses to just about all of them, but I've still, we're still up behind by a few. Okay. Um, trying to, trying to kind of see the order of, uh, questions here. So Paul, do you remember the last question you read the response to? I do not. I'll kind of look through here. Um, well, so I, I think I'll, I'll start where I think we might have okay. touched off. Um, there are a few that were older questions that I had to had missed and went back to answer. Um, so folks, did you respond about the folks asking about if an organization um, could apply for both grants? Yes, we did talk about that. Okay. So yes, yeah, so we've covered that. Um, yeah, so you you may only ultimately receive one of the two grants. So you can apply for both, but if you receive a regional grant, you would not be able to also receive an opportunity grant. Um, there was a question about if a partner on a regional grant could receive an opportunity grant? And the answer to that is yes. Um, a organization might be a partner, um, even a potentially a, a, a sub within a regional re-engagement effort. However, if they receive an opportunity grant, that funding must be used for a completely distinct purpose. You can't um, duplicate funding. So, um, you know, if you have some separate um, work or, or costs that you would be applying for with an opportunity grant, that would be allowable. Um, we've talked about credit attainment and GED. Um, there was a question about um, startup, and you know I wasn't really able to answer that one. I don't know. So Kathy added another response. So um, I'll read this out. So Kathy says we'd be facilitating connections with school districts. Um, I'm going to copy this into my Word document here. Sorry, folks. Um, Uh, they, they would be facilitating connections with a number of entities to refer youth to the life skills program. It would require different scopes of work depending on which population of youth life skills would be working with. If just youth who have disengaged from school, the outputs would be different than youth who is either in the adult or juvenile system. So I kind of feel like there's maybe two things going on here. In terms of startup, I think what I was trying to figure out was um, would services be delivered? Or is by startup do we mean um, simply facilitating planning and collaboration? And I believe, Paul, that we would want to see service delivery happening. I mean, the goal, particularly with the opportunity grants, is to get resources out for rapid response and service delivery. Would you agree with that? I would. Correct. Thank you. And then um, to the second part of Kathy's question, um, the, um, you know, in terms of different outputs or outcomes, so it sounds like there might be youth who need reengagement services um, and youth who may not. I don't know if I totally understand it exactly. Um, I apologize. It's just a little hard to maybe answer that on the fly. So if it, um, my sense is that we will take this response, or sorry, this second question, Kathy, and try to work on that a little bit. If you have maybe additional thoughts, I, I'm trying to understand if there's different services that are not re-engagement services happening. We want to clarify that, but we'll kind of come back with hopefully another response if we can come up with it. I'm going to move on from there. And I've got um, one here, Cord. I'm kind of going to of what ones we've answered. Okay. So what date will funds be distributed by? So all startup funds are requested and the claim being be submitted um, following the execution of the grant agreement. So those will be early uh, coming out. The remainder of those funds are claimed on a quarterly basis. And those are set uh, for an April reporting and a July uh, 21 reporting on that. So... Another question I see is uh, to make sure I understand proposals may serve youth outside of the priority region. Um, so absolutely, yes. Uh, the re-engagement opportunity grants, uh, those can be located anywhere. Uh, the regional re-engagement grants, a priority region must be served, but then the priority region is further defined through the proposed service area within that. So it'll include, it can include that if that's what best meets the needs of that local area.
so Erica asked a second question. I think I responded to this one. Um, so, so the grant starts on January 4th. When would funds be awarded? Um, kind of going back to the question about reimbursement. So in this grant, unlike prior um, YDD grants, in my experience, we are offering some startup funding up to 20% of the budget may be allocated to startup costs. Um, so that funding would be available once the grant is executed. Our goal is to get grant agreements executed as early as possible. Once that's executed, a grantee would be able to submit their first claim for those startup costs. But the remainder of the grant is reimbursement based. So the other 80% of the funds would be billed for costs incurred for service delivery. And our billing cycle is quarterly. So that means that uh, of the funds uh, that would be reimbursed, you'd be able to bill us in April for the period running from January through March 31st and July for the period running from April through June 30th. All right. So, Court, I've got um, the next one down here. So, we are physically located outside of a priority region, but we have a long documented history of serving clients who come from a priority region. Would that impact our eligibility for a reengagement opportunity grant? So, Cord's response was the reengagement opportunity grant, again, is open uh, to youth and communities anywhere in the state. The regional reengagement grant service delivery must happen within the priority region. However, the applicant organization may have locations outside of the priority region. So, if services are delivered in communities with a priority region, it, please indicate that uh, in, your, in the response in the application. Um, the next question I see is, can a regional coordinator have a partner who also receive a single grant? The answer is yes. An organization that's participating as a regional, regional collaborative or regional re-engagement as a partner may receive an opportunity grant. Um, but uh, there's a note here that funds must be used for distinct non-duplicative pur purposes. So uh, the idea, again, is to support as, most youth, as many youth as we can throughout the state of Oregon. Um, so does opportunity grant application need to be located within the priority region? Again, that, that is no, the opportunity grant is open to all communities. Um, the YDD will be um, looking to support at least one uh, opportunity grant in each priority region. See, so a question I just responded to, someone asked about how certain we are that this could become a renewable grant. So we are not certain at this time. Um, we're looking into it. We've never done that before, but our goal is to see about um, trying to renew the agreements for the regional grants, um, but we're still working through that process. And as, as noted, I think in an early response, unfortunately the funds don't carry over. Um, there is a comment that I should respond to. Um, uh, you know, it, it seems extremely challenging to establish and provide supports to vulnerable students for six months and then be unsure about funding to continue the support. There is potential that this could harm and not help youth. And yeah, we hear you. Um, you know, one of the things that is difficult about this funding is that the Student Success Act funds, which support this grant, were originally supposed to be available as of July 1, so there was only one year of funding. Um, but back at the time when we'd be preparing to launch an RFA, um, due to the fiscal uh, uncertainty, the revenue forecast at that time, we were asked to pause on our launch of the grant. So we recognize the challenge here of the very short duration of these grants. Um, this, this, I understand the concerns here that are expressed, um, but our goal is to try to get funds out and to support folks that are able to provide services and respond. I recognize that, you know, that may not fit in the goal of, um, you know, a long duration um, of work, but, um, you know, these are kind of the constraints that we are working within. So I appreciate the, the, the comment there, but that's, you know, a little bit of just kind of why, why we're in the situation we're in. I don't know if you want to add anything to that, Paul. No, it's, I think you said it very well. Unfortunately, we were definitely on hold for, for quite a while as that was getting sorted out. So, we do recognize the shortness of that, and that that has been part of our conversations of how to how to best support um, applications and, and grantees. So, a couple of questions here: What does ROG stand for? That's the Regional Opportunity Grant. That's the smaller of the two. The RRG, or excuse me, yes, uh, is the re ROG is the 
Reengagement Opportunity Grant, and the RRG is the Regional Reengagement Grant, which is focused more on um, doing a collaborative re regional uh, focus. Uh, one of the other questions I see is if an organization provides services across multiple priority regions, would that be all? Would that all be included in one application, or would those be separate applications? That would be all included in one application. And this online system is set up to allow you to, to recognize that and document that in the initial screening. Trying to see if we're missing anything here, Corey. There's a couple I haven't responded to, but I just put out a couple. So Kathy, thank you again for clarifying your question. Yeah, I, I'd like to, to get with our team and um, we'll get back to you with a response to your um, question there. Um, we had another question about um, an individual said that they are with a small organization and wanted to know whether funds could be used to hire a contractor to write the grant. The answer to that is unfortunately no. You may not um, apply the costs of applying for this to your budget within the RFA um, as per restrictions that are noted in the RFA document. Um, one thing I'd note is that um, we have uh, done our best to, you know, we, we recognize that some organizations don't have a lot of grant writing capacity. So we've tried to um, uh, ensure that scoring is based on the, the content, the response, you know, whether the, you know, material abilities and services and everything else that is asked for is demonstrated and not, you know, so much on the style. So we're really trying to not, um, you know, limit you based on your um, having a staff grant writer or not, but unfortunately the cost of applying may not be included in the budget. Um, and so, then, uh, um, go ahead, Paul. Oh, so um, looks like Heather asked a question, will reporting requirements be supported with templates that you will provide? Yes, we will be designing that as we move forward. These little boxes are hard to read some of these questions. All right. Let's see. So I think we've we've covered most of these. Okay. Um, I I'm just kind of looking back. I know we don't have folks don't have the ability to um, tell us if we missed something. So I'm just going to scan one more time. Oh, I see one that I haven't responded to. The question is: If an organization provides services across multiple priority regions, would that all be included in one application? Or would those be separate applications? Yes. And I uh, already. Sorry for it. I didn't mean to interrupt you. We. Um, Did you respond to? It? Yeah, you were typing, so that's okay. Sorry. So, let me copy it and look. Can you can you state your answer again so I can capture that? Absolutely. So yes, uh, it would be supported in one application, and the initial screening allows you to recognize multiple priority areas. Awesome. Thank you. And then you'd further, obviously, further to further define that in the um, proposed service area. So as we are kind of scanning through these questions, uh, if we, for some reason, have missed your question, if you wouldn't mind uh, putting that into the chat box again, because it'll come to the bottom of our screen. Uh, and I, hey, Brian, thanks for joining us again. That way we can kind of monitor them both. Um, okay, so the, that's a great question about the online application. Uh, no, you can save your progress as you work through it. You do not have to sit down and do it all at once on that. Um, a note about that application, though, as you do the initial uh, screening, once you submit that, uh, that is locked, and then you move into the um, question response part of the Q&A, or of the RFA, excuse me. Hey, Paul, we got a question about the online application. Um, uh, they ask, is the online application one that you enter all at once, or can you save drafts? Oh, sorry, and, I answered that uh, while you were talking. Oh, you thinking. got it. Oh, yeah, sorry. Yeah, yeah. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> and then did you see the one about a minimum number of youth to be served? Yes. So there is no minimum number of surf, uh, youth to be served identified within the RFA. Um, that'll be talked about within your um, proposed um, 
population of, of service. And so that's one of the first couple of questions that that applicant applicant will be responding to, and but there is no defined requirement. All right, kind of giving it a couple moments. Um, again, uh, just as a um, not a requirement, but a recommendation, if you haven't signed up for Orpin, that's a great way to receive the automated um, updates to the Q&A as those come out. Our goal will be to update those on a weekly basis and provide more information on the website regarding that. But that would come out uh, through the Orpin uh, registration, which is free of charge and, and keeps you updated in a little bit different fashion. Hey, Paul, can I just please jump in here at the end and just want to again thank both of you for um, managing this. Uh, thank all the participants. Didn't mention from the top that our overarching governing body, the Youth Development Council, has been uh, critical in uh, our leadership around re-engagement. So if there are YDC members, we really appreciate your leadership and helping spread the word. And I think to this question that I believe Cord had answered about um, the continuation, again, just want to reiterate what Cord said, that we appreciate that six months is a short window and then just what what happens beyond that once you've engaged a kid what's going to or a student a young person once you've engaged someone we're working our tails off as you might imagine to um to identify and and and, and find uh, continuing funds for the next biennium so i don't want to sit here and make any guarantees i don't think that's uh, valuable but i just want everybody to know that we're committed um as a division to um building out a system um, that's our goal, and that is going to take more than six months, right? That's going to take uh, well into the next bien next biennium and beyond, and and so we're going to stay com as committed on that um, as we can. In addition to doing this work over the next six months, that I think will help sort of lay the groundwork for what will come uh, down the line. Thank you, Brian. Well, Gord and Brian, I can say that we uh, did pretty good on our time frame of we're sitting at 255. So um, I looking, it doesn't look like we have more questions coming in and uh, we're having some attendees sign off. So uh, please do know and note the single point of contact should you have additional questions. Uh, Sonia is a wonderful um, lady to work with and she'll make sure to get the responses that are needed as well as post that on uh, the Q&A document as we update it. Um, again, we want to thank you for joining us and all of the support as we've moved forward with this. We look forward to uh, to seeing this the, these grants come forward. Thank you. Thanks, everybody. Hey, Paul, do you mind leaving it up for just a minute so I can, can make you? sure I screen cap all the questions? Yep, uh, I can do that. I'd help you, Cord, but I don't want to screw it up. No, it's okay. Since uh, I think I've got a system, I'm going to go ahead and uh, try to get all this, and then we'll we'll regroup to pull all these into a document. Yeah, I'll send out another invite here shortly. All right, I think I've got it, so I'm going to go ahead and log off. Thanks, everybody. Yeah, thank you. Um, Do you before you go, Paul? This is Sonia. Um, are we going to debrief this? Yes, a I'll little send, bit. Yes, I'll send an invite here in just uh, a couple moments. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Melissa. If you want to go ahead and end the conference, would be great. Sorry. No, no problem. <laughs> Bye -bye. I just it's hidden in my screen, so I can't find it. I've got it. All right. Thanks, everybody. <laughs>